This is the 10th episode of Charting Tracks and is the first of three in which we discuss the art of performance. At the beginning, we must do a legal disclaimer. All views expressed are our own and do not represent the opinions of any employers, organisations or clients for whom we work. Any recommendations or advice given in this podcast may or may not be right for you depending on your circumstances. Please bear this in mind before taking any action. Okay. Uh, Charting Tracks is brought to you by Chris O'Gorman, Amir Yacoub and Ben hennessy Garside. Chris is a digital marketing strategist and digital manager. He's worked previously for Sony Music and was a head of digital at Capital Records UK. He currently runs a digital marketing agency and develops music artists, working on brand development and marketing strategy. Amir is a record producer, Grammy Award winning engineer, a co-owner of Bison Productions Recording Studios in East London and the director of Garnish Music Production School in London. Ben is a singing coach, multi-instrumentalist. Oh, I'm Ben. I am a singing coach, multi-instrumentalist, composer, and producer. In the past, he's worked. I have worked in music instrument retail as a record label scout, a live sound engineer, and I'm currently a lecturer at Leeds Conservatoire, teaching voice to popular music students alongside being a dad and a husband. Um, yeah, so that was my intro, everybody. <laughs> I hope you, I hope it was formal enough for you all. I love it. I love it. Your voice Did, had lots of gravity. Lots of gravity. Yeah, at the beginning. And then I couldn't remember who I was anymore. Um, but anyway, let's go. <laughs> <laughs> let's move on. Um, so today we're talking about the art of performing. Mm. The art of performing. Yes, indeed. Um... Anybody want to want to start, or should I should I run on? You run on. You run on. Yeah. yeah? <laughs> okay. Um. So, uh, performance. I think the first thing is probably good to try and define some terms. So, first question is, and what do we mean by performance? Just uh, and I, you know, I'd like the listeners, the viewers, to be asking themselves that question as well. And then maybe we'll jump in ahead um, and just and throw out what what we think performance means. I'm going to jump in, as you said. I'm going to start. So I'm I'm going to say. So for me, with performance, there's something about it being it taking place in the moment, right? As opposed to a recording, which is something that can be repeatable, played back. And also because of the the repeatable nature of it, it can be uh, edited. Um, the thing about a performance is there's something about the in the momentness of it that requires a different set of uh, characteristics that a recording does. Um, so on some of the earlier episodes of Charting Tracks, for example, um, I, I've pre-recorded that introduction and it went a lot more smoothly than this last one just did. <laughs> um, so there's something in the performance that was possibly lacking, but or possibly more human and more real. Mm. And that's another interesting piece is that there's something in the act of performance, i.e. a human being in a, spe a specific place, specific time, doing what they do, um, even to the extent that things are perhaps imperfect or not correct, um, sometimes there's something more meaningful um more honest certainly more human about the whole thing right defo i think it's part of the reason why um people still feel that drive and that pull to want to watch things live yep. you know um whether it's live streamed mm. whether it's in person um yeah, that, I think lots of lots of our colleagues and lots of loads of people up and down the country are probably missing the right now because we're in the middle of coronavirus and and the the effects of that and um there's lots of people probably missing missing live performance there's, there's something about being there in the moment that 
changes things. It's it's different from a recording. Mm. Um, so yeah, I mean that's that I've, that I've put that on the table. Any any of you want to pick up the pick up the ball and run with it? Well, I was actually just thinking as you were saying that. Um, I think okay, for performance. What do we? What can performance mean? So yeah, mm. it can mean. I think what people most people think of straight is like a live performance. So an artist on a stage and a audience watching them in a room or out, outdoors, but in in real world. Mm. Um, I think it's traditionally, but it can also mean a performance on a recording as well. So when you were saying that, it's like, well, actually, that's interesting because tri- I guess kind of recording, and I think we we're saying this in our last episode that was about recording, like when recording first started, it was more about capturing a performance. Mm. So you'd have an orchestra or a band and they pretty much used to be playing live and they're going to run the track. They're going to, you know, perform the, the piece of music from start to bo- start to finish. And it's just a live recording of that performance and that's what it was and that's why you get performance royalties on recordings because it's still a performance you know even though you know it is it's a reproduction of the performance Mm. and it's somewhere along the way that that sort of evolved i think maybe recordings kind of you know i guess more as it's become more computerized and digitized and it's become more about production stuff maybe it's become less because you know now it's like we're going to do loads of overdubs again you do loads of vocal takes and stuff and stuff and maybe i think maybe then recording is now not necessarily be seen uh sorry a performance has maybe moved away from being the 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 fact that there can be a recording of a performance um but having said that you get still uh, lots of you know live albums you know tour dvds and things like that that are recordings of a performance um but I still, I guess, like the, the thing that they're doing there, it's, it's still the capturing of music being made. I think the key thing is, like you said, in real time, because even though that recording is, you know, post facto, I think that's right. Um, it, it's capturing as close to possible as as what the environment was. Um, and I think that's the kind of thing. It, it, it's the real time sort of element of it and the imperfections the variations and the changes that happen, like the fact that it's slightly different from the recorded version, you know, especially if you've got the album and you're going to watch a new, you know, watch an artist perform live, it's the variations that kind of give it, you know, the, the changing and the variation, the involving of, of the, of the music from the recorded work to the, to the live performance. And, and it can also, it can mean, you know, performing in a room to an audience. It can mean performing on a record. It can also mean performing, I think this is much more common these days, is uh, performing, like you said, on a live stream and like Instagram lives and YouTube lives and stuff like that is now, mm. especially in sort of lockdown, uh, COVID um, world that we're in, um, that's becoming a more and more viable um, way of uh, artists performing for their audiences and actually selling tickets for digital gigs for online gigs where it's you know like okay I'm going to do a live stream and there's a hundred people that can come into the stream and it's you know buy tickets watch it, and it's set up like a performance to all intents mm-hmm. purposes the same thing it's the same set they perform um, just virtually and I think that's um those are the sort of, I think, the key things of, of what a performance is. But I suppose it's the act of actually bringing the music forth in some kind of real time um, slash live environment. I think that's what it means to me. <laughs> mm. It used to be a lot more simple, didn't it? Yeah, it did. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> because even now, a live stream, you can rewatch it. So, you know, you can go back and. and so it's yeah, not necessarily exactly. like an Instagram live. You can still watch it up until, you know, up until it comes off. So even then it's not that simple. <laughs> yeah. So what what do you think, Amir? Um, performance to me really just means um, doing, doing something for other people. So, you know, uh, we might be sitting there and we might be practicing. We might be, you know, bashing away a piano or on a guitar and singing at the same time. And um, in... And of itself, when you're doing that, you might class it as practice or you might class it as, you know, something else which is not a performance as such until there's another person in the room or 
another person um, present in whichever way. Um, and, you know, that's when it becomes a performance. Um, so, yeah, for me, I guess my, well, how I would define it is um, is quite simply any time someone else is involved in hearing what you have done in a musical way, obviously, you know, um, performance isn't limited to just music, but this is a podcast about music. So we're just going to talk about that. <laughs> right. But, you know, anytime anyone says involved, one thing that came up in my mind, actually, not that I was ever asked to do this, but, you know, if you were a kid and you were like a really good singer or, or dancer or whatever it was, um, and your mum or dad might say to you, oh, why don't you sing for your auntie, whoever? Um, that is a performance. Um, mm. Because you would be singing for somebody else and uh, and or playing your instruments for someone else. Um, so uh, bare bones, very simple kind of stuff. That's how I would see it. Now, obviously, as you guys have both said, this translates in a different way to uh, stages, to studio to live streams, to, funnily enough, um, games as well. So, you know, they're doing live performances in games now. So Marshmallow, the DJ producer, did one. Uh, Travis Scott did one as well. Um, so, the, the, I mean, we're constantly uh, evolving and changing in, 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 in different ways and to get music heard. Um, but those would have been performances, mm. Um for those people in those gaming arenas and stuff like yeah. that. So yeah, that's what I would say. Maybe it's the audience. It's the having uh, a relationship, uh, sorry, an interaction between performer and audience. That's what it boils down to for me. Um, you know, um, obviously we're going to talk about studio performance, but even when, when I'm, recording someone and recording their vocals or instrument um i am experiencing a performance and mm -hmm. when i put my producer hat on i'm pro obviously thinking does this performance convey the message of the song and if it does then great it's a great take but obviously we can do like you said chris we can do takes and takes and takes and takes and perfect that yeah going back to what ben said as well we can perfect that but I suppose performance really, if we're going to be real about it, is is that that real-time thing where we can't actually perfect it. And if we forget our lyrics and we sing, or hmm. sing the wrong note, or and if we drop our... Has anyone seen um, the YouTube video of the guy who's playing keyboard on stage and, and his keyboard just falls? No, no. <laughs> I've not seen that, no. Watch it, it's hilarious. Um, Excellent. <laughs> we'll put a link up for you guys so, link to so that. you can watch that. that. Sounds... Yeah. <laughs> I will what, definitely. he keeps going? No. <laughs> I was going to say, how would he... <laughs> <laughs> what is it? Is this like a brutal? Is this <laughs> honestly? <laughs> it's like a high school show, uh, um, and the guy's playing the, playing the keyboard, and his and the keyboard stand just falls oh. and drops, and obviously he's just a, like, what? <laughs> uh, what am I supposed to do? Um, so, yeah, essentially, um, all of those things are going to happen. You know, um, I, I mean, I could talk to you about live performances where my monitors weren't on and I had to run around to the monitor guy mm. and behind the smoke machine and go, <laughs> oh, put on my monitors. And, yeah. you know, I had the piano intro of the song and, you know, all of that kind of stuff. That's a performance. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. Yeah. I mean, you don't have time. You can't stop and go, okay, let's. So yeah. 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 There's no perfecting well, that, yeah. you know, it happens all in the practice stage, but, you know, performance is, like you said, it, it's real time, mm. um, and that is performance. <laughs> Obviously, your performances, they can be recorded, replayed, you know, all of that, um, but that performance happens at one point in time, and, and bang, that's it, it's there forever, if, if it's recorded. Yeah. Mm. So I'm, I'm obviously I'm interested in the ways that people can refine their performances, right? We're talking here about the art of performance, and of course, um, and there's something in the conversation that's all, already come up around um, around the possible around mistake, 
mm. the possibility for mistake. Um, and then the, so there's an interest from the audience's perspective on uh, witnessing witnessing somebody have control um, in such a way that they don't make mistakes. There's something about that. Um, you know, part of the excitement, I think, when, you know, as an audience member and a performer, I guess, is that, like, something's going to happen here. You know, like, we're in this space together. There's this potential for catastrophe, like you've 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 laid out, <laughs> yeah. And you know, and when you go and see um, a real, you know, a brilliant performer, um, either the catastrophe is managed in such a way that it's um, it's turned into something meaningful in and of itself, um, which I, I think I'm sure it was an old jazz. It might have been Dizzy Gillespie, or something. I I can't remember exactly which one, but. Um, said something along the lines of, if you make a mistake, make the same mistake yeah. again, and then it's no longer a mistake and it was always meant to happen. <laughs> yeah, I know. It was Miles Davis that said um, something was, like... Was that a Dav was it yeah, Davis, was it? He, he, he said something... Um, it's not a mistake if you play a wrong note. It's not a mistake if you play the right note after it or something like that. I can't yeah. quite... There's another version I heard of something like that that was like... A mistake repeated again and again uh, or, or like if you make a mistake repeat it again and then it's not a mistake it's jazz <laughs> exactly <laughs> yeah exactly right. something along those lines yeah exactly yeah. <laughs> but there's something in that too right which is like um and i mean you know even outside of the outside of the jazz world there are ways of pulling pulling a mistake back into the artistic process i'm thinking of I remember going to see uh, Oasis play mm. um, and it would have been, uh, oh, years ago. Uh, it was a stadium gig. It was a Bolton stadium on um, the fourth album. Mm. It was Standing on the Shoulder of Giants, I think it was that tour anyway. Um, and uh, Noel Gallagher came on to do, his, to do his thing where he sits down and plays just by himself, does an acoustic thing. And the... Um, uh, his guitar was out of tune or some other performer might have just felt really particularly like anxious. You'd have seen it in their face. They'd have been really stressed out that like it would have become a big problem. Um, he, what he did was typical, which was he kind of loudly complained that the guitar tech hadn't done their job properly, you know, <laughs> and, and said, you know, you pay, I pay however much money for a, for a guitar tuner. And uh, you know, and it and it doesn't even work, um, you know. Turned it into a kind of joke that sat actually quite neatly within their uh, artistic persona and their frame, and we all laughed. And it was fun. It wasn't awkward. It wasn't weird. It was part of the performance. And if anything, it's kind of quite an endearing moment. It's like, yeah, you're a bloke, and we're all people. And do you know what I mean? Like you're just a guy on stage and we're just guys in a crowd or gals or, you know, whatever I'm, I'm using that uh, generally, but um, that, that sense of, um, of normalcy actually helped the thing. Mm. Um, now there are other artists for whom that kind of thing just can't happen mm. really. Mm. And, and it not just be awful. You know, there's some certain artists coming to mind where everything needs to be just right. Like a thing can't go wrong, you know, um, and so that's another interesting thing is that the requirements of a given performance, the level of precision, and what's considered a mistake or not, and you know, like it's going to be totally different from a, a punk performance compared to a, a piece of I don't know a I don't know, what's I'm within the pop world. What's kind of the most maybe like prog rock or something where precision is and, and excellence are vital. That thing, that requirement of, of what's good and what's bad is going to change based on setting. And I think that's the thing about uh, watching a live performance that is the thrilling part of it. It's something could go wrong. <laughs> 
um, and how are the how is this performer going to handle that? And, and and it pretty much always does, to be honest. I I don't think any show really goes or f- goes ahead without because so, you have to, you know you you could have the most rehearsed show, you know, have it completely down. You still got a, a variable a variable an unknown there, which is the audience, mm. and you don't know how they're going to react to something. You don't know what you know what you get what you're going to get from them and um i think that's what like kind of the examples that you were giving i think uh you know i've seen so many gigs where you know it might be or shows where you know something goes wrong and it's a type of artist where it's they can make a joke of it and it's um tends to be a lot of kind of solo artists singer songwriters as well actually mm. that can kind of go well stop i forgot the lyrics there i don't even know my own lyrics okay turns it into <laughs> a joke we can crack on and get back straight you know obviously if you've got a band and a big production behind you it's yep. far harder to do that because every, you know everybody's working to you know it's very very rehearsed and it's you can't really do stuff on the fly quite as much um i guess it's lucky for uh, for Noel Gallagher in the example that you gave that it was on this solo song where he was mm. able to to do that had it been you know <laughs> had it been a band number he would have been I don't know how that, uh, yeah I don't know how he would have handled that that would have been a, a lot more difficult yeah. to stop the whole band and it's you know I think I, I got I got the impression as well from that from that gig that it was like there was the Oasis like all the members of Oasis yeah. but then there were a few session musicians around as mm. well um, but but there wasn't there weren't uh, playing to track mm. um i don't think yeah i mean these things can be hidden quite well but um, yeah. i i got the impression that, that that wasn't going on and that's the other thing is that more and more artists now are they're they're, they're throwing recorded material in behind them yeah um and it's it can sound great like sometimes you should really do it but as you say you're gonna lose this potential to manage the thing if things go go wrong you know if you play the wrong section and then you've got your i don't know your your big fat thick string section due to come in on the chorus and you instead of playing the chorus you play the bridge or something and then you've got these strings booming out actually it's interesting you said that because I, I remember using an example of somebody that i've seen so many times obviously it's i'm gonna say Torre Amos because it's my favorite artist <laughs> for anyone that doesn't know and i've seen her more than any other artist and i've seen her in every setting so i've seen her with just the piano and her i've seen her with a band uh, like a traditional band uh you know bass guitar drums um uh, yeah so it was like a four-piece band like um uh, and then i've seen her sort of a, a jazz band like a trio like her bass uh, her bass and drums no guitar and i've seen her with a an orchestra and the 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 they're very different completely different the 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 one and the ones that are kind of i've seen her where like she'll forget a lyric or do something you know something doesn't go quite go right and she's like i'm just gonna st-. or she'll stop midway song i'm not feeling this song actually uh, i i don't feel like i don't feel like playing this actually i'm gonna play something else and just and she can do that but then i remember there was some something that happened uh, 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 at the albert hall show that she was doing and it was with the with the live orchestra proper you know classical orchestra and um yeah there, there was some mistake that happened and she was like i have to stop the whole <laughs> I have to stop the whole orchestra here and i suppose that's the the decision making process is different then because normally she's just like i can stop this and it's no problem i can have a little banter with the audience and then crack on um I, if i'm going to stop this now i've got a choice do i let it go keep going and let the mistake stand and try and come back in and, you know, even if that means the piano drops out and my vocal drops out and I let the orchestra play until I can come back in, or do I stop it? And it, in that case, it means I have to stop the whole orchestra. So it completely changes, you know, what your options are and how free you can be. You know, somebody like Ed Sheeran, again, can just kind of probably stop and readjust quite quickly and um, and chop and change. Um, the more you have going on, or, you know, somebody like Lady Gaga, somebody like somebody that has a big production, Beyonce that has a big production show, you're going to be very hard to do that. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so it's, it's that's the thing. It's, um, again, certain genres, a certain type of artists, the imperfections and the flaws and stuff like that is kind of like, oh, it kind of makes it special a little bit, to be honest, because I quite liked those moments 
when something went wrong and I was like, oh, I feel like I'm really, I'm not just at home listening to the, the CD. Um, and there's other shows where you go, you're like, I could be listening to the CD here. In fact, it's so good. It's such an accurate re uh, creation. I could, I could be listening to the CD if I shut my eyes. <laughs> um, so yeah, I don't, and I, and I don't know. They're two different things, but I'm not saying that one's any better. But because I've, again, I've, I've seen Beyonce live, and it was absolutely thrilling, and it was an excellent, you know, show. Um, I, I, I guess with 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 Beyonce though, there's a whole lot of visual stuff you're getting that you wouldn't, you aren't going to get from a, a recorded performance. So, you know, I, she could probably reproduce a lot of what she does alongside all of the visual stuff and the staging and the you know, if she could rep reproduce a lot of the musical content pretty much, you know, bar for bar, you know, as, as the recording is, and still get away with giving value. Because the because the, the visual element is so strong. Yeah, I think that's right. I think that's right. And I think that's probably the case for a lot of those types of artists. There's there's something else they're bringing in. It's the visual, it's the um, the staging and, and, uh, and the, yeah, the whole production that goes with it. I, I, I do prefer, like, I do like it when they develop their material, though. I, you know, make, like, if, yeah. if you've got a single out soon or something, fine, then do it like the original or, you know. But, yeah, I personally, and this is just personal, I mean, again, who am I? I'm just me. But I, personally, um, I, I want to see something fresh. Like, reimagine your work. Yeah. And they usually do, don't they? Because they get, I think they get probably so bored of playing the same especially if it's a single they're like by the time you get to a single on a tour they'll normally have changed it up quite quite a lot right oh yeah but yeah but probably by the end yeah mm. Mm. yeah yeah they've got to otherwise you know they'll bore everyone yeah. to tears and and they'll bore themselves to tears yeah. as actually as well um i think um one of the most impressive things for me about performance is and i suppose in both of the cases that you guys have said is um being able to command. Mm. So whether you're a Noel Gallagher with just one out of tune guitar or Tori Amos at the Albert Hall with the orchestra backing you, the ability to command and say, stop, <laughs> this isn't going yeah. right. You know what? My fans deserve better than this <laughs> out of tune guitar or whatever is going on in, in this big song here. Um, the ability to do that is really what we show up for to a live mm. performance because you know um i i think what separates a good performer from a great performer is the ability to command the people around you and i mean that not only when mistakes happen but i mean that actually when mistakes aren't happening and to a certain degree yes you can rehearse giving your band cues and all of that kind of stuff um, but working with great musicians al alongside you, you can definitely make some stuff happen on the fly. I guess that's why jazz performance is so interesting to me, um, because there's this language that has been spoken between people, which is just like, oh yeah, I'm about to hit a solo. Do you know that I'm about to hit a solo? Um, and, the, and the bass player's like, yeah, I know you're about to hit a solo. I'm just going to make way for you, you know? And that's all done without anything blatant and they're just picking up on little phrases and having interplay with each other and there's all of that communication that's happening but as a performer you know um when you think of a typical performer like a singer um who's giving a show i think the commanding is like that's a big part of it your audience wants to be led somewhere Mm -hmm. They want you to take them on a journey. They want you to put on a show. So commanding it in in just in general, uh, I think that's been the most impressive thing for me when I've seen live performances. Um, I feel like that would that would be the difference between a good and a great performer yeah. um, most of the time. Obviously, yeah, we can somewhat almost perfectly recreate songs records if you want to call it that um just, you know um many people do that on on stage but you know um even if i think about um ben mentioned um uh playing with tracks and stuff like that even if i think about a performer like um uh ariana grande for instance 
she's got a lot of tracks that are happening, obviously, but the live performance that she has with her, even in a smaller situation, they are adding some something new, yeah. something exciting. And, and that's, as a performer, you should actually be getting up on stage and thinking, how can I take my listeners somewhere where they haven't mm. been? The record is the record, and and like you rightly said, Chris, you know we can listen to that record all day long on repeat if we want to yeah. um, go out to a live show um, to, and to you don't that. do that to listen yeah. to a record. Yeah. Um, you go out for something else. And that, that's where Ben is absolutely correct in saying, um, let's go somewhere else. Let's develop this somehow. Um, let's not give the same version that we did on the record um, infamously like there's a Prince bootleg of him doing a nine minute guitar solo on Purple Rain somewhere <laughs> yeah. that's just nine minutes of solo obviously <laughs> some might say that's a bit overkill um, but you know it's it's pretty epic <laughs> and I, mean, I bet in the moment when you're there as well it's like I bet it wouldn't feel like overkill I feel like it better feel like yeah exactly yeah, I, bet. I mean of course it would yeah. you know um, and, and I suppose even someone who was as um, as big as Prince was, and you know he could easily just walk on stage and play a few songs and exactly the same form as they were on the record, and just be like, "See you later, guys. Thank you very much for your money, and I'll see you next time I'm in town." Yeah. Um, but you know, I suppose this is where performance meets artistry. This is where performance meets evolving and developing, and. Like Chris right, rightly said about Tori Amos, she's not just giving you one look. She's giving you the look of herself on a, a, a piano and then a more a jazz trio setup and then traditional band setup and then the orchestral setup. Um, it actually makes people want to come and see you. Yeah. Um, even if they've seen you, how many times, Chris? I don't even want to ask, Eight, you know. nine, ten. No, you know? maybe ten. Right. <laughs> Mm. So Tori Amos was like, I'm com I'm coming to town and I'm playing piano with Imogen Heaps. Yeah. <laughs> with the gloves, yeah. With now, the music gloves cool. she's got, I'd love right? to see that. So Chris is going to be there That's in an, an excellent. If I, I would love some promoter to do that. That would be well, brilliant. <laughs> well, Tori, if you're listening, uh, which which uh, which I know you are, yeah. <laughs> maybe just send Chris a letter or an email. <laughs> And give me 10% of exactly. the tanking. <laughs> <laughs> I'm here for it, 100%. <laughs> uh, um, so, yeah, just maybe trying to just label some of the, the refinable uh, maybe skills or um, mindsets or something. Mm. There's something. So um, a willingness to extend upon and embellish what you've already done, right? So there's a willing, a willingness and a capacity to be able to do that. So a little bit of improvisation and in the moment um, creativity, or at the very least um, a willingness in, in, say there's a band, a willingness amongst all of you to be open to reinterpretation mm. um, of the material that's already, already down. Uh, another thing worth thinking about is you raised it, Amir, which is about, it's kind of about being in control and being in command. And there's something about being kind of comfortable with whatever's whatever's happening. There's a, a self-assurance, isn't there? That's And you might get that self-assurance from really, really practicing and, you know, to the point that you're never going to make any, um, any mistakes. Um, or it might come from the fact that you you're confident enough in your own ability to improvise on the spot to fix the problem once it's happened mm, yeah. or your however you've set yourself up as a an art uh, your artistic persona whether that encompasses some mm. kind of the things that in other settings would be seen to be mistakes right because that's the other thing you know if a little bit of chaotic um uh action i don't know is if is 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 going to be present then bear that in mind you know like if if the music you're making needs to be perfect and yet when you perform you make mistakes from time to time maybe that's the wrong 
genre or style for you maybe you need to you need to be thinking about something that's going to allow for those uh, quote unquote imperfections and i'm saying quote unquote imperfections because you know music it's not a race right there aren't winners and losers yeah for in in one style being able to play every note perfectly at, at whatever ridiculous tempo um is exactly what's required and, and in another style being as raucous chaotic and imperfect as 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 you can is actually what's required so there's something again it's about like knowing you knowing who you are as an artist like which which piece of the human condition or which pieces of the human condition are you speaking to and um make sure that your performance lives in the same space yeah agreed um just to pick up on one point there ben when you talk about comfort mm. and being comfortable if you're trying to do too much and you're and it doesn't fit in with who you are and when it doesn't fit in with your genre and your artistic persona you're going to look a inauthentic but b out of your depth and that's not going to make for a, a good performance because the audience will see right through it yeah yeah there's that's a th that's a, that kind of comes back to i think the thing that we spoke about a few episodes ago about authenticity and mm. how do you convey that through into a live performance and you know because i think there's a lot when you come come to you know when you're an artist and you've kind of put out an album you put out a record whatever and you're at the stage of you know taking it you know taking it into a live realm there are loads of decisions to be made and that's like okay how am i gonna you know how am i gonna put this show together what is it is it going to be as close to the album as possible is it going to be different is it going to just be me or you know if i'm a instrumentalist a singer song or whatever is it just going to be me is it going to be the band and there's lots lots of different um um considerations to have there and i think like a big one is the authenticity um uh issue because uh, depending on what you know sort of what persona or archetype you've put out there you know what's going to fit best is it going to be having the polished polished band is it going to be having something rough around the edges and a bit more grungy is it going to be you know an intimate kind of setting if you're a sensitive singer songwriter you know venues and you know all of there's all of these considerations actually that then kind of come into play and and then also there's financial considerations because then it's like well actually I, uh the more people and production i have the more um you know the more it's going to cost and then the more money that i'm going to have to you know put from ticket sales and into that and uh there's all those considerations as well so it's an interesting um yeah i mean could we dig into some of those chris because you raised yeah. some really important points i mean so so the the venue and the setting and the space um anyone want to want to lead on that on the well i mean that's going to make a huge difference isn't it i mean uh, for instance chris when you saw um T tori amos with just a piano where did you see that do you remember uh, Hammersmith uh, Apollo. Great. So that's a decent venue. And then mm -hmm. when you saw her with an orchestra, that was... It was Albert Hall, yeah. Right? And I think actually having... I haven't seen her just as, just on solo piano at the Albert Hall. I would think it would not work as well, to be honest with you, just because the Albert Hall is like a bit... I don't know that there's a huge difference in like capacity in terms of the actual audience size yep. of the two venues. I think Albert Hall is a, is a bit bigger um but it's more like the the way it's shaped and like the way it, you know it's a building that is yes they do pop concerts there they do rock concerts but it's set up for an orchestra that's the acoustics that's the way it's built and i think that just ju like sort of just piano vocal would really just be it would just be too wide a space and it would just i don't that's what i would think i haven't seen it so i don't know um but it made sense to me that the or you've got this orchestra tour you're doing orchestral reimaginations of your previous albums that's absolutely the right venue for that yeah mm. for that setting or, or the barbican would have been or you know what like a, a a a venue that is really set up for 
uh, sort of orchestral music. Yeah. Um, so that's the thing. It's so so that completely makes sense. But then there's, um, and that's when you're at a stage, I suppose, in your career when you can sort of you know that you can fill that venue and you know that you can have that choice and you know yeah yeah as a startup artist or a fledgling artist you're not exactly going to be like yeah oh, yeah tomorrow i'm playing the royal abbot hall yeah, and you're playing wherever you can most of the time and then if you're on a support tour as well well you're going to be playing on in, in a venue that is right for the main act doesn't mean it's going to be right for the support act but you're lucky to get the support act gig and you're just going to be happy with that but it means that mm, it might mean that you're playing in a venue that isn't necessarily set up and then you've got you know isn't set up specifically for you because it's set up for the main you know it's done with the main act in mind um and then how you adapt for that and then do you do a different version of what you would normally do for that support set or do you just try and make it work as best you can yeah i mean support slots are really tricky aren't they they are they don't they definitely are no yeah. one's there to see you first and foremost uh you get the dregs of sound check <laughs> the very dregs especially if you're because a lot of these times like you know uh you might have two support acts so you've got like the sort of main support act and then you've got the the local support act so you'll get the one support act that kind of goes on the road with the artist and then you get maybe one that's sort of more local to each city so you might have mm. a different one and that's sort of the the main and if you're one of those <laughs> you're like if you get five minutes of sound check that then you'll be really lucky to get that <laughs> so you really are yeah it's difficult and and yeah it's funny that we're talking about the difficulty of of being a support act the difficulty in general of you as a performer at any given venue so let's say you are performing you're not even performing as a support act, but you're performing at a venue where you haven't performed before and you get a bad sound check, right? This automatically is going to affect your performance in some way because you might not have the correct monitoring coming back to you, so you can't hear what's going on. If you're in key, you can't hear the bloody bass line or whatever it is. You're missing cues left, right, and center. Um and I suppose something like that's always going to take you back to, I have to be able to deal with all of these potential things that can go wrong in a way which feels comfortable and confident and commanding. Um, and I think, um, yeah, support, uh, well, having a support slot actually will teach you a lot of that. <laughs> yeah, because yeah, you, you learn every kind of... You're going to have a lot of problems thing that can happen and you have to roll with it and you yeah and you sort of learn, have to learn how to um adapt and i think that's and that's actually what i think a lot of the, the great performers have is like you said this ability to command but also the ability to adapt on the spot when they need to um and they can change it up and they can you know if something unexpected happens it's like they i think with a more inexpo inexperienced performer you get that <sighs> that fear just fear yeah. um but then with a with a much more experienced performer i think then you kind of it's like ah been here before okay yeah and they sort of know what to do and you don't you don't get that sort of rabbit in the headlights moment i think the the other thing um the other thing i would say on that is that there are certain there are even there are usually things that you can get under your control in those situations that at first you might not think you do Mm. So stuff like your like monitoring, well, it's if if you can, you can get your own monitoring system set up. You know, um, that's going to mean every that that you're you're taking as much of that monitoring work away from the engineers um, at the at the uh, venue as possible. Um, is it going to be perfect? No, because there's going to be, they're going to want to use, say, it's likely that they're going to want to use their microphones and their setup. And, but if, if you could have your own, um, as much of your own monitoring in place as possible, like if you're working with, with, with a track, well, that might be all you need for all your cues, right? If you're working with the track and, um, you've got you, you're going to need your stereo send out to the sound engineers 
but then you could have some other other sends in your setup that are going to be just your monitoring sends, which means that it might not be perfect. You may not hear everything as the audience are hearing them, but if you've got something that's 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 going to just help you know at least where to play, mm-hmm. in in the case that the monitoring, the in-house monitoring is awful, then um, then so so it's, it's it's that question of well, what can I do, and make sure you're doing all those things. That's the other thing too is is just running and so like how much how much can I bring in under my control? Um, so yeah, that plus the confidence and ability to to adapt, um, and you and you being really well rehearsed as well, like really knowing your stuff, perhaps to the point that you don't necessarily need all of that input from everyone. Mm to know where to play because um, you've heard it so many times in the room that um, you, you can get a decent enough feel for, for whereabouts you are in a given given song at any moment. Um, you should be all right. <laughs> Practice hard, keep as much in, control, in your own control as possible and um, yeah. Make sure you're holding, as we've already talked about, there's a whole bunch of things that if you do them all, your performance can be mm. can be good, you know. Yeah. If not yeah. great. Yeah, you can definitely um, take control of much, as much as possible to make it as great as you possibly can, you know. Mm. Um, but many of the live musicians that I know, They'll have their own monitoring set up. They'll have their own in-ears, all of that kind of stuff, uh, standard. Yep. They've encountered enough problems in the early parts of their career to know how to kind of overcome and 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 what to bring into their um, setup or skill set, whatever. Um, obviously, different musicians are going to need different things just based on whoever they are. The drummer's going to need some extra drumsticks, for instance. Huh. Uh, hits one of them too hard and it breaks halfway through the performance. He can just reach down and grab another one and he's... he's... Yep. And so, you know, um, it, it comes down to... Uh, it does actually come down, rightly down, to controlling what you can control <laughs> and knowing that there are things out of your control as well. Um, there would have been many situations on stage where people have, you know, the drummer's gone to the bridge where the bassist has gone to the final chorus and uh, forgetting there that there was a bridge. And, uh, you know, um, that's out of your control. Um, you... If you were James Brown, you would f- fine or sack that bass player, wouldn't you? <laughs> um, um, a bit harsh, but you know uh, it happened. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think it's yeah, it depends, doesn't it? Depends on the act. It depends on the nature of the act. And James Brown, obviously, that was his that was his style, wasn't it? Well, yeah, he had a super tight funk band all of the time, didn't he? So, um, you know, miss notes and mistakes weren't really tolerated because he could just basically. Um, mm work with the best musicians in the country and the world, in fact. Yeah. And there where you're saying best, you're meaning people who can reproduce uh, what's required at the moment that it's required. Exactly the same. Yeah. Yeah. Because it might be other artists that were like, no, I want you to do something different. I want you to yeah. absolutely experiment. And that's kind of what's going to keep it fresh for me. And they, uh, it's, a, it's probably a slightly different skill, isn't it? Um, Cause you're almost composing on the spot as well as performing and it's sort of yeah there's there's a weird there's a sort of overlap isn't there between kind of live like especially with improvising like you were saying of jazz before it's kind of like you're almost composing and performing on the spot right yeah exactly because you're looking to create nice new melodic mm. lines and you know riffs that people can can latch on to and in the audience and and if that is your style some people are just like, I'm going to play whatever I want and I'm just going to go hell for leather. Um, and, mm. you know, I, I don't really care whether people can latch onto this or not because I'm here to 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 do something else, which is interesting, right? Um, because actually now I'm thinking back to what I said and thinking that performing is for an audience. But then perhaps having said what I've said 
then that person might be performing also for themselves to kind of push themselves and explore, mm. um, you know, new things within themselves. Um, so, yeah. Well, that's, uh, yeah, that's interesting because then what's the, di- because, well, because both of you, when you work with artists, you know, obviously rehearsing is a, you know, whether it's rehearsing, getting ready for recording or rehearsing, getting ready f- to do a live show or a performance of some kind, um, what's the difference between sort of rehearsing the, the piece of music or whatever so that it's down you remember the lyrics like everybody knows when they're playing what in the band or whatever okay because you could then go okay we're done now mm-hmm. but actually that's not because then to get to a great performance actually then it's like well that's just the music that we're going to be playing and the lyrics and fine but then there's like where I'm going to put emotion in this part, where I'm going to put an inflection in that part, where I'm going to pull back there, where I'm going to, you know, what I'm doing with my body as I'm standing there, what I'm, who I'm looking at. Um, and I was just interested from, from, from both of your perspectives when you're working with, I mean, when you're working with artists and then when you're working with students and artists, um, how do you get to that bit? say like when you've done the whole you know you can play the song everyone can play the song in the band or the artist can play the song top to bottom and not forget the lyrics and not mess up and it's good it's great what then elevates up a notch and elevates it to then a great performance yeah Uh, i have an answer for that but uh, do do you want to go ahead amir no no no. you go first you go first okay so uh for me it's about it's it's about having a story having an understanding of the song that's deeper than just being able to repeat the words back um every single word has a potential uh, emotion attached to it mm. um and it, it do, do we, and, and often there's a there's a selection like how do you want to interpret a lyric right i mean as yeah. a obviously as a as a voice coach it's it's the singing voice that i'm most interested yeah. in here but but there are versions of this that can work for different instruments as well but um and especially in the pop world most more often than not uh, you know 95 percent of the time more more um there's a lyric attached to mm. to the note so it's it's not just the note played at a certain level um in time there's a, an emotional valence behind that and as we've discussed i think i think we've discussed earlier uh, but i mean I'll, I'll say it again anyway um this each emotion kind of is an embodied response and an embodied reaction and that that will carry in the way the the note is delivered yeah so um and but often i find singers find it very difficult to get into that place of feeling something unless they have a sense of there being a story behind the song yeah so there's a protagonist there's somebody who's being spoken to there's a a reason for that thing to be um to be said and sometimes asking those questions can help bring up and then the question will ha- you know how is the protagonist feeling in that moment as they're expressing this thing yeah or the other one is you know h- how do you want your audience to be feeling like physically in their body where like where are they where do you mm. want them um there's this thing um in this th- thing that we and we use we use the use it to learn with this this uh, mirror mirror neurons thing and by presenting yourself in a certain way anybody witnessing that is also gonna there's going to be a sympathetic response in them um some of it's some of it's visual if they can see that you look a certain emotional shape for want of a better Mm. phrase then uh then they'll they'll respond in kind and equally they can hear that too in the in the uh in the in the sound of of your voice they'll there's a an, an emotion in there Mm. um so it's about and and this is a there's a tightrope because on the one hand you do want to be emotionally invested in the song it needs to be felt it needs to be rooted in something truly human and and real right but at the same time you don't want to be you know if you're singing say a song about something quite sad and you're and you're really feeling that sadness Mm. to the point that you can't control anything anymore and you just burst into tears on stage You know, like can be, which can heighten the performance and even make maybe, it like wow. 
or it can be like if someone's crying all the way through a set though then no (laughs) yeah yeah if if there's one song and there's a slight tear running down the cheek or there's a yeah yeah maybe maybe um but it's that you know it's it's dipping that toe in the truth (laughs) yeah yeah um in 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 a a felt fully fully embodied felt way yeah i think that's something that musical theater performers seem to do quite well because they you know even if like musical theater isn't isn't you know isn't your particular uh you know start of music you enjoy or genre you enjoy but there is something to be learned from from those people because I think what they're actually really good at is, like you just said, embodying a song and telling the story because they're, they're acting. Why they're, why they're they're not just singing the, the 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 song, the piece of music. They're not just singing the lyrics. They're acting the whole way mm. through. Their body is acting like, and they are embodying that story, that emotion of the of the song, and um, and are kind of really conveying the meaning of it and attached to it, but then can also step out of it and not fall to pieces and cry, and cry in the middle. Yeah. So you can strike a... And bless them as well, because their work, like, so it's like yeah. they're, they're vocally, they have to be absolutely top notch in shape. Like every night, sometimes twice, twice a day for matinee days. Yeah. yeah. Right. Eight shows a week. And, and, you know, <laughs> and they have to bring it all like i have so, i have a lot of so much respect they're, they're, they're like they're kind of like athletes actually and it's like i do think it's actually you know people from different genres you know even if you're in a a rock band or in a there's something you can learn from those people actually in, t- in terms of their of that and there's, there's actually this really good scene in this in the film levy on rose which is the uh uh, sort of bio, uh, autobiographical film about Edith Piaf. Mm. And there's a bit where her sort of, when she's quite young and she's like sort of in her teenage, so early 20s, I think, when she's sort of been discovered and like the impresario slash manager guy that's kind of, you know, developing her is rehearsing with her and um, they've got the piano pianist in her and, and, and him and he's like directing her to, you know, and she's got the song down. It sounds amazing. It sounds vocally perfect and it's, and he's just like, no, no, where's the emotion? Where, like, and he's drilling her. It's a really good scene, actually, because she's like, mm. I couldn't be singing this song more perfect. <laughs> like, what? <laughs> but it's like, what are your hands doing? Why, you know, what, why, why are you doing that with your hands? Why would you be doing that with your hands? But in that particular moment in the song, what, what, who's the character that's singing this song? And what, you know, and he breaks all of that down. And those are all the things that actually took her from being a, a great singer to a amazing performer. And um, and a, and a legend and then it's that sort of small um well it sounds quite it's those small sort of differences that really make a performance right yeah and the another reason why it's hard as well is it, it's not like these characters are your own inventions mm. right that are based you know even only loosely on your own self mm. right you're you are beat you're handed i mean it, you're not you're you know there's an audition process so if you can't yeah. bring the character then you you, you can't but yeah. there's also this sense of it's someone's written this thing and you're fitting in their box mm. and you and there's all this extra athleticism required and you need to bring all all that emotion yeah um, so yeah it's uh, utmost respect um i'm so glad it's not my <laughs> i don't have to do that you know um yeah that's the same same actually for opera singers as well. I think is a similar thing. Sorry, Amir. Go on. No, no, no. I was just going to say musical theatre and and the people that sing musical theatre night after mm. night after night are crazy, crazy. And so ends the latest instalment of charting tracks. Uh, please like, subscribe, click, share, star, rate. Leave us some messages. Let us know what you're thinking and feeling. Um, And yeah, thank you so much. And we'll hopefully see you next time. Bye-bye.